Brothers and sisters, happy Divine Mercy Sunday. This is pro-life leader Frank Pavone. It is the octave of Easter. It is the second Sunday of Easter. It is Divine Mercy Sunday. We are celebrating and rejoicing in the infinite mercy of God shown to us in these great events that we've been celebrating, the death and resurrection of Christ. Thanks for joining me here. Put your prayer intentions, if you wish, in the comments, and let's delve into this powerful gospel reading that defines the meaning of this day and, in fact, the meaning of salvation. Put ourselves in the presence of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you are the God of infinite mercy. The death of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross is a revelation of the meaning of love, the greatest symbol of which is not the heart, but the crucifix. We praise you, Lord God, for this mercy. In the past, in fragmentary and varied ways, your prophets expressed your mercy. But only now has it been fully revealed in your Son, who died for us while we were yet sinners. It is hard that even a good a person should die for a good person, but to do so for sinners, and to do so in a way that can cleanse a billion worlds of all their sin with just one drop of his blood, we praise you today. Thank you, Lord God. May we always seek your mercy. May we never tired of seeking your mercy. Forgive us now. Let we repent deeply right now for all our sins. And we pray that the grace of repentance might come to those who do not yet have it, who are still attached to or even justifying their sins. And we pray today in a special way for those who have committed the sin of abortion in one way or another, whether it was the woman on whose body the procedure was done, or the man who may have consented to it, or other people who consented or participated in it. May they repent, may they find mercy. May we all experience your salvation and peace through the one who died and lives again, Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. A reading from the Gospel of John. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. Well, once again, blessed Divine Mercy Sunday. You know, this reading ends with a powerful lesson about why we have the Bible. This doesn't get enough attention. 
Notice that John says, there are many other things not included in the Scriptures. Because the Scriptures are not meant to be a comprehensive account of everything that Jesus said and did. It's not meant to be that. It's meant to be giving us the word that we need in order to believe, in order to find forgiveness and salvation. It, it, the word is tailored to one specific purpose. Not to a answer every question that we have, not to have an exhaustive historical uh, account, but that you may come to believe. And that's also why, as I often explain, Jesus didn't heal and cure and raise from the dead everybody in sight. He was doing those miracles in order, very same reason, that you may come to believe. Because then believing and enter into a relationship with him and having eternal life and ultimately rising from the dead and being in the life of heaven, first of all, we're going to have every question answered. We're going to hear all the things that were never written down about the signs Jesus gave his disciples. And indeed, we will be fully healed of everything that ails us. So, that's the first point. But that we may come to believe so that our sins may be forgiven. Remember, Jesus said on Easter Sunday night, in addition to what we read just now, that repentance is to be preached for the forgiveness of sins. What, what, what is to be preached now that he has gone through his passion, has risen from the dead, is sitting with the disciples, gives them the Great Commission. What is to be preached is repentance. He doesn't say acceptance is to be preached to all the nations. Hey, everybody, God loves you just the way you are. Come on in. No, it's repentance. Hey, you're, you, you recognize your sins. You're doing wrong and change and receive the power of God to change your life. In fact, to live a new life in Jesus Christ. This is what mercy is about. We celebrate today divine mercy. In His mercy, before we could earn it, without us ever deserving it, we can't earn it, but before we even could even try, and before we could even want it or know enough to ask for it, God died for us. God died. This is God in the flesh. Jesus shed His blood. We didn't ask for or earn it. This is his choice, his initiative of infinite love. Mercy is not primarily his response to us. It's his response to himself as infinite love coming after us purely from his own initiative. Not just in dying for us. Mercy starts when? At creation. You want to go into the Bible and read about God's mercy? You don't go first to the passage we read today. You don't go first to the passage about uh, Him dying on the cross. You don't go first to the passage about repenting of sin. You go to the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's mercy right from page 1, verse 1. And right to the very end of the Bible, yes, I am coming soon. Why? Because of mercy. His mercy is His intervention coming into creation and making it, making us, and deciding that He wants us to be with Him. He created us to be with Him. And that's the same reason He redeemed us. And all of that is for the reason that He is mercy itself, infinite mercy, infinite love. That's our starting point. That mercy is a gift to us. It's also a duty. Because if His mercy is what creates us out of nothing, redeems us when we don't deserve it, and rescues us from slavery, because having created us, we then rebelled. His people were in slavery in Egypt. He showed mercy in the Exodus went and set them free. And then the fulfillment of the Exodus on the cross set us free from sin and death, rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, the slavery to sin and death. This puts a duty on us to rescue others. We have to have ears open to the cries for mercy that our brothers and sisters send to us. We have to exercise the works of mercy 
right? The gift of mercy gives us the duty to exercise the works of mercy. If we've received truth, we need to pass it on to those who don't know it. And that's one of the works of mercy. If we've received, furthermore, forgiveness of sin, we have to be ready to forgive others. And if we've received life, we got to be ready to defend the lives of others. It's mercy which is the heart and soul and foundation of the pro-life movement. We say, Lord, have mercy, save me. I cannot save myself. And then we've got these helpless children in the womb crying out without a voice. Have mercy on me. I cannot save myself. We intervene to save them from abortion. We are exercising and becoming a sign of God's infinite mercy. But then let's focus on what happened on this first Easter night because Jesus imparted to these apostles the ministry of reconciliation, as St. Paul talks about. We proclaim repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says to them, you can actually pass it on. Not by some power or virtue of your own. Doesn't mean these, these men are better than anyone else or, or less sinful. It means they've been given a gift of the Holy Spirit to actually impart to others the forgiveness of sins that comes from God upon repentance. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. The institution of the sacrament of penance, or what we call popularly confession in the Catholic religion. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. It's right there. Now, as has often been pointed out, in order to determine which sins they're going to forgive and which sins they're going to retain, they need to know what those sins are which is where the confession of the sins comes from. Thomas is absent. Why? Gospel doesn't tell us. I'm wondering if maybe it's because of what he says next. He's got to be somebody who actually sees Jesus, and so maybe he was out looking for him. Who knows? But it's when he returns to the company of the others, when we stay in union with the community of believers, the church, that then we encounter Christ, because he did that following week. And we see there mercy given to Thomas, enabling him to touch mercy, literally, those wounds of Christ by which he says peace. Now, here's where I want to draw a connection with the devotion to divine mercy that so many of us are so deeply aware of, brothers and sisters. St. Faustina was given a special revelation, and she speaks about this in her diary, of divine mercy. And she was given the special chaplet of divine mercy that so many of us pray, so many of us in the pro-life movement pray. And we know the image of Jesus. Jesus, I trust in thee. The image of divine mercy where we see Jesus risen from the dead, and the rays are coming out from him. On the cross, the soldier pierced the, him with a lance, and at once there flowed out blood and water, the fountain of sacramental life in the church, the blood of Christ coming to us in the Eucharist, the water, the waters of baptism. And this is illustrated by the, the rays coming from Jesus' heart. Now, when you see that image of divine mercy, you are seeing the meaning of these words, peace be with you, and you are seeing the fulfillment of something that happened in the Old Testament. That is, the Day of Atonement. There was a day in the Jewish feast days of the calendar on which the high priest would go into the temple, into the most sacred part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, and beg God for the forgiveness of the sins of the people, using the blood of animals, splashing it on the very throne of God called the propitiatory, there in the Holy of Holies, the seat of God on earth. And having done the prescribed ritual, would come out and declare to the people that their sins were forgiven. Now, the letter to the Hebrews goes into great detail 
about saying that that ritual, those liturgies of old, were pointing to Christ. The temple is the sanctuary of heaven itself, and the blood is no longer the blood of animals. He went in and offered his own blood, and the high priest is Jesus himself. It's a high priest using his own blood and then entering the sanctuary of heaven. He sacrificed his own blood in atonement for our sins on the cross. And then what happened in this passage right here? This is the revelation of mercy. Just as in another sense, the crucifixion itself is. But here on Jesus, uh, on Easter night, is revealing his mercy. Peace be with you. Peace. Reconciled now with God and with one another and with creation, with our very selves, because sin divides us in all those areas. He's looking at them now, showing them his wounds. There's a reason they're still visible, because he has to teach us this lesson. And saying, because I offered my blood for you, you now have peace. So what is happening here? In this passage, in this event, and in the image of the divine mercy, Jesus the high priest is appearing before his people, announcing as high priest that their sins are forgiven because the sacrifice of the blood has been offered. And those rays, we see it in a, in a, in a two-dimensional picture, it looks like they're point, going down, they're actually coming out straight at you and me. He's showing us his wounds. He's showing us the meaning of love. And he's saying, your sins are forgiven. Divine mercy was revealed to St. Faustina. God said, I'm going to give you this beautiful prayer. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. And we say that over and over again in such a soothing rhythm, assuring us of the triumph of mercy over judgment, as Scripture tells us. Brothers and sisters, God told St. Faustina and through her all of us to pray for God's mercy on his world. Now, Father Seraphim Michalenko was her, the postulator of her cause for canonization. I knew him. We spoke often, uh, and we had, we had beautiful times together. And he writes about how her confessor, in testifying during the process of her canonization, was asked this question. When God said to her that we have to make reparation for the sins of the world, pray for God's mercy for the sins of the world, was there any sin in particular for which God was instructing us to beg for mercy? And he said, yes, the sin of abortion. And even in her diary, St. Faustina indicates that at a certain point she experienced tremendous pains at certain hours in the evening and asked the Lord, what does this mean? And he revealed to her that it was pain representing the mothers who were aborting their babies. Above all the sin of abortion. We intercede for God's mercy for all the sins of the world, obviously. But in particular, killing the infant children in the womb was one sin that God in particular wanted these prayers for mercy to ascend. And that's why the Chaplet of Divine Mercy is so prevalent and popular within the pro-life movement, and may it always be. Because the gospel of life is the gospel of mercy. And we who reject abortion do not reject those who've had abortions. Rather, we embrace them with the mercy, the love, the peace, the forgiveness of Christ. 
Those rays coming from the risen Jesus, from the high priest coming out of the temple and announcing to the people that their sins are forgiven, is directed to us all and in particular to those who having either had the abortion procedure or cooperated in it or even performed it as abortionists, having repented of their sins, brothers and sisters, that mercy is theirs. I've ministered to so many people in my role as pastoral director of the world's largest ministry for healing after abortion, that is Rachel's Vineyard, and of the Silent No More campaign, the largest mobilization of those who've had abortions and who speak out about their experience. I've ministered to people who has, uh, have had as many as 26 abortions. I've ministered to Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the, 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 the architect of the abortion industry. I've ministered to Norma McCorvey, the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. The burden that these people carried is unspeakable. And yet they all trusted in God's mercy. They took hold of that mercy. They, like Thomas, put their hands into his side touched that mercy, believed in it, and found that peace. And now it's time for us to do the same thing, whether we've been involved in abortion or not. And this is one of the reasons for the testimonies of the Silent No More campaign. Read them at abortiontestimonies.com. Watch them because even if you haven't had direct involvement with abortion, the fact that someone can get up there and say, I had my children killed, but you know what? I found God's mercy gives hope to us all. Gives hope to every repentant sinner. Oh, yes. From creation to the cross. From the beginning of human history to its end. From the greatest to the least of every human being we celebrate and receive today divine mercy. Let's never fail to trust it. Let's never fail to ask for it. Let's never fail to proclaim it to the world. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us, shedding your blood, rising for us. Thank you for announcing to us as our high priest the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for showing us your, your wounds that we might have the peace that passes all understanding, the peace you so want to give to your people who have been alienated by sin, but whom you have reconciled through your blood. What a feast. Enjoy it. Celebrate it deeply. Proclaim it to the world. Amen. We thank you, Jesus. Now we intercede that every sinner who has not repented may receive the grace of repentance. For, Lord, you demand that we separate ourselves from sin. At Easter, we have renewed the vows of our baptism, and we have said publicly that we renounce sin. Lord, for those who are not renouncing their sins, give the grace of repentance. May we help to lead others to the grace of repentance by bearing witness to how evil sin is. Give us the grace of repentance, Lord God. And for us who do repent, assure us again of your mercy. Mercy which is not permission. Mercy which is restoration, reconciliation. And Lord, we pray for those babies in the womb, unprotected, at risk of abortion, we pray that we may exercise mercy towards them by speaking up for them, by showing up for them at the places where they're being killed. We pray that we may show mercy to them by rescuing them. And Lord God, for all those who are far away, bring them back. And as we continue to walk the road of discipleship, may we be stronger than ever against temptation of every kind. Thank you for your mercy. May we celebrate it forever. And now we pray in the words that mercy himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We pray to our Heavenly Mother, the Mother of Mercy. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Friends, happy Divine Mercy Sunday. What a joy to be with you. Uh, let others people know about these scripture broadcasts. There's some people you can reach that we can't. And we thank you for helping us do that. God bless you. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, which is the Feast of the Annunciation. And we'll have a lot more to rejoice in. God bless. Hello, this is Abby Johnson of Unplanned the Movie. You know me as a longtime supporter of Priest for Life and of Father Frank Pavone. And I just want to encourage you as someone who knows of the great work of this organization, please continue to stand strong. Please continue to support this mission. It is so needed now more than ever. Thank you so much for all of your support.